You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Randy Susan Myers. Well, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show for you. Go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. Any way that you download podcasts, you can listen to it there. I'd like to talk about some sponsors before we get started. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experience. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques, learn from a vast collection of free writing resources, make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.com. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've ever seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into that routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach those word count goals. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words. Stay for the fun. It's ForTheWords.com. That's the number four, TheWords.com. Writers. The internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity, but it can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat-in-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal, like spending less than one hour per day on email, to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours a day on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off our Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Randy Susan Myers on the show with me. She has a fantastic new novel called Wasted that uh, gave me all the emotions, and uh, so I'm super excited to talk about it today. Uh, Welcome to the show, Randy. Thank you, Hank. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, I've had the book for a couple of weeks now, maybe... Uh, maybe closer to a month, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've I've read pieces of it kind of along uh, as I have done show prep for other shows, and I always come back to this book, and I'm excited to jump back in. So uh, I'm excited to talk about it today. Oh, uh, wonderful. Yeah. That makes me feel fantastic. <laughs> but we begin each show with the same questions, and we have to get that out of the way before we do anything else. And that question is, Okay. what is your first memory? of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I'm sorry, you know what? I missed the first part of the question. Sure, sure. We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, well, the first time I told stories was, of course, to myself. I lived in Brooklyn in this kind of ratty old apartment. Um, Yeah, definitely ratty, definitely old. And... I couldn't go to sleep without reading, but my mother would make us turn the lights off and I would hold my book outside the window so I'd catch the street light as long as I could. 
but it's just so long you can hang out a window, even in Brooklyn. <laughs> and so then um, I would tell myself stories, and I would pretend I was taking a book off a shelf, and I remember actually reaching up, and I'd give it a little title, and then I'd put myself to sleep by telling myself stories, of which I must admit I was always the hero. <laughs> of course you were. Of course you were. <laughs> Um, what what kinds of books and stories really captured your imagination back then? Well, even from a very young age, I was really captured by books of, I guess I would call it social issues, although, you know, I certainly didn't know the name then. I was a kid who went to the library every single day um, because, A, we didn't have many books in the house, and, B, I read very, very fast, and ignored everything else for reading and what I would read I'd go on binges like I went on a binge about kids with disabilities adopted into families one of the books I remember loving so much was um, The Family That Nobody Wanted by Helen Doss I cannot believe I remember that uh, and then I, would, then I moved into my Holocaust time and my slavery time. So I was a pretty serious little reader, even at a young age. Although I certainly did have my Trixie Belden moments. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But uh, it it sounds like uh, it sounds like you were definitely a serious kid. Did did your uh, parents or a teacher or anyone along the way kind of notice this uh, this thing about you and and recognize the storyteller gene? Do you think? No. 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 <laughs> this is what happened. I was, I was, um, I skipped third grade in New York City. Then they used to give you these IQ tests and then skip you. So I was already young. So I was very young, and I would kind of hang back a little bit. Um, and I would often read instead of doing my homework. So I wasn't a star student. And they would always shock the teachers when I did very well in. I would always do well in the. Um, the citywide tests, and anything that had to do with reading. And so the once I wrote a story that they called up my mother and accused me of um, plagiarizing. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so That's... I guess that was the first indication <laughs> that, um, that perhaps I, I was not only such a good liar, they thought I was lying about lying. Um, and so, you know, I had one of those... You know, mother was a party girl who worked long hours, and I really did kind of just raise myself to the library. Can I tell you a story about Absolutely. how that came back to really be amazing? One of my favorite books in the whole world was and still is, in many ways, A Tree Girls in Brooklyn. Okay, right. In fact, I am now in the midst of reading, listening to it on audio. For the, and it's the first time I've heard it on audio. I've read it many times. And I've written about it, about how it really saved my life and how uh, my only church was, was synagogue was the library and the Tree Girls in Brooklyn was my Bible. Well, I recently put it up. I forget where. I put it up again, Huffington Post maybe. I got an email recently from Betty Smith's granddaughter. Oh, my goodness. And I started crying. It was just so wonderful, thanking me for everything I had written about her grandmother. It was one of my most special moments. It was pretty recently. Oh, that is amazing. I, I also have read that book several times, but have never listened to the audio. I'm, I'm going to have to do that now. Kate Burton reads it. Oh, that's, that's going to be fantastic. I've, I've, been, I've been like using it in bits. Of, I use my audio books like while I'm cleaning and driving, oh, yeah. and it has been a joy. I'll and it's you, a surprise, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have to add that to my Audible queue. I'll have to do that. Um, what you you went through several phases uh, of of uh, causes or um, social issues that you were that kind of sink yourself into. Um, and did you ever think about uh, taking those stories and and, uh, and and doing something with them as you're reading about these times and places and events did did it ever strike you to to write about them um at that point at the point when i could have become a serious writer you know, i always wrote myself 
you know, little stories and lived inside my head. Um, but at that m- point, I was really involved with protests on the street <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, I have a picture of me uh, protesting the war in Vietnam when I'm in high school, marching, me and like 12 other people. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess that, and then I became, you know, a little bit, mm, you know, went away to Berkeley for a while. And then I suddenly got married at 19. Um, so life kind of became very odd and had children. And then I was very caught up in that. Well, you um, you talked about when you could have been a serious writer. Uh, you know, I think there's, I think writing comes back to us at just the right time. Um, and and sometimes while while there are many writers who write brilliantly in their you know late teens, early twenties, and really have something to say, um, I know for me, I couldn't have written the kinds of things that I really wanted to at that age. I needed to. To, to learn some things, get some life experience. Um, do you feel like that was the case for you? Did did all of the experiences you have have had up to that point, did, did you think they made you a better writer in a roundabout way? Oh, absolutely. I, though I published a non, a co-author nonfiction book in my late twenties and pub, and had it published, I didn't, published novels. My first novel I published when I was 57, and I think in a very odd way, it was exactly the right time. I had been through many lifetimes, many jobs, um, much experience, and I was now very settled in as much as I was remarried to a, and am still remarried, (laughs) to a very good and responsible and calm man. My life was very calm and it became exactly the time that I could visit the maelstrom of crazy that was inside me from all the all the previous years. I needed that distance, there's no doubt. Yeah. Well, and, and all of the time previous to that uh, gives you great fodder for stories, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. And I couldn't have written about them then because they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, I really, I teach writing also and I always tell people you need distance on whatever you've gone through. I uh, don't try to, people do that. They try to live it and then write it immediately. And, and I guess sometimes it works, but um, for me, not so much. Well, it, it, I think there have been some pretty powerful uh, memoir uh, that have been written uh, kind of in, in the midst of things. But but even those are better uh, with some distance, some time, and some perspective, aren't they? I think so. You know, my the, the what I think of as my life's quote, that which I live by now, is from Flaubert. Oh, God, I have such a bad Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> Really, I can't get rid of it. And I've been away from Brooklyn for a long time. Uh, from, by Gustave Flaubert. Flo, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Flaubert. Be regular and orderly in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. And that's exactly how I feel right now. I saw that on your website, and I knew there was a story behind that. Uh, I, I think that's a fantastic quote. The um that there is something to finding peace in your life and then letting uh, the other stuff come out in your art. I really feel that way. I, I think if I wasn't so comfortable with my my husband and, and my life right now and who I am, I couldn't be who I am on the page. I have no reader over my shoulder. You know what I mean? I'm not worried that my husband will read it or that my, you know, anybody in my family. And the few things that I know I never want to visit because it's not mine to tell, those stay locked away. Um, you talked about coming back to writing uh, after uh, pursuing this this whole life full of experiences. Uh, what was that first novel that drew you back in that uh, that you had to write? The Murderer's Daughters. Okay. What, what was, was where where did that come from for you? That came from uh, a. I was very ready to pursue my life stream, which was to be a writer and to be serious about it. I had written my practice novels. I had plenty of them all over the place, 
but now I, but this was the one that I needed to combine craft with passion. That was on the craft side. On the passion side, uh, there were two things going, a couple of things going on. One is that I was working with batterers, with men who were violent with their partners. And I felt like the story that never got told was the story of the, of the families of the batterers. And as I was playing with how I was going to approach that, I spoke to my sister and I told her, oh, I think I'm going to write blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, why don't you write about us? I said, what? Why, why would I write about us? And she reminded me again <laughs> of the story of how my father tried to kill our mother. She, I was about four or five. She was... Uh, three years old, three and a half years older. And she had told me the story before. It wasn't like I had never heard this story. But I kept forgetting it, it which is very odd because I was there at the time. I mean, talk about your mind playing tricks on you. And my father died when he was 35. And I had a very, and they, my parents were divorced. And we had a close relationship and I managed to never remember this thing. But then when I sat down to write the first chapter, of the murderer's daughters, which is about two sisters who witnessed their father murder their mother and then how it what happened from then. And my father didn't succeed, by the way, in murdering my mother. Well, when I sent my sister that first chapter, she said, and I quote, that she went, had to go to the bathroom and throw up afterwards because I captured it so on target, except for the murder. And I, I, it just came from somewhere inside I still don't consciously remember it. Wow. That, uh, that feedback from your sister, um, did, did you take that as encouragement, e even as hard as that is to hear? That, oh, that you, absolutely. Yeah, that, that it was so visceral that it, it, it caused that reaction in her. But you as a storyteller, that had to make you feel great. It did. And I also had a wonderful quality that I can say is wonderful because it's such a weird quality. I'm a good dissociator. <laughs> so I can dissociate from almost anything unless it has to do with my children. And so I can be two people at once and I can go right into the, to a character and become that character. I'm, it's like I'm a method writer. I become the character and yet turn it off at the end of, at the, end of the session and not even think about it. It's a very um, odd. And the rest of the book took pieces emotionally from our lives. But, it, you know, our mother didn't die and we didn't end up in an orphanage and we didn't end up with all the things that, you know, and a father in jail. But I was able to touch on many things. So that was the book that I, the novel, my first novel that got published. Isn't that interesting that, uh, that fiction, uh, e even though we're making up stories, you know, and, and we've heard the, uh, the idea before that, that fiction is the truth within the lie, uh, that, you know, uh, allows us to, uh, to kind of work out things that, that we don't even remember sometimes, uh, while telling a story and, and other people may not ever, you know, know the, the thing that was going on behind that. But, uh, it's really this magical thing that, uh, that defies description sometimes. I think the person that, that, for me, that put it the best, and I've stolen this from her many times, but but she knows I've stolen it. I've told her, so it's okay. Um, and I give her credit each time. The writer, Carolyn Hurst, um, one of her books is The Nobody's Album, which is about a, it's a novel about a novelist, which, you know, we always love, right? Um, and this novelist is always asked if the book is about her, which all, all of us are always asked about. And her answer is so on target. She says, when you bake cookies, you put in butter, you fold it in, and then when you bite into the cookie, it tastes wonderful, but you don't bite into a big lump of butter. The butter has flavored the cookies, and that's what I think authors are, with the butter I, and the cookies. I love that. And Isn't that I, great? I've, yeah, that, that is fantastic. Um, I, I've often said that, that writers put themselves all – in their story, uh, but usually in places that the, that the reader, uh, that is not obvious to the reader. Um, we find ourselves in all of the characters, but your metaphor is way better. I like that. Well, Carolyn's, 
<laughs> metaphor. You can steal it from me, from her. That will do. <laughs> Proper attribution. <laughs> so um, after having written that book, getting the response that you did from your sister, having it published, what did that do for you uh, in the pursuit of this lifelong dream? Uh, I, I mean, obviously, y you haven't stopped since then. So uh, how did that change your life? It changed my life so, so totally. I really was very lucky. I, you know, had, like many of us, I had worked long and hard to find my agent, and it, had, and then I broke up with an agent. Then I had to get, so the whole walk towards the murderer's daughters was very long. But then my wonderful um, agent sold it really fast. And then it became the target book club pick for the country for a month. And so it really gave me the ability to make it my full-time work with the help of also having a wonderful partner by my side, my husband. Um, and I've just put my head down and been doing it ever since. And now number five is coming out. That is fantastic. Um, let's talk about the new book, Wasted. Um, Wasted is spelled... Uh, funny from the way you would normally think of uh, of the word wasted. Tell us the genesis of this book. And um, I, I mentioned earlier that this book gave me all of the feelings. And it's it's funny, uh, and it's very wry, and it is uh, touching in a lot of different ways. What was the the motivation for this book initially? Well, I had the first line for this book for years. And I avoided writing this book. I knew I wanted to write this book. And the first line is, everyone hates a fat woman. Mm. And that came from wanting to write something about women's obsession with their weight for years. But that meant I had to look at my obsession. And I grew up in a household with a very thin mother and a very thin sister and me. Didn't fit into the category of the very thin, not even the mildly thin, um, not even thin. And with a mother who was obsessed with me about my weight. In fact, she would all, probably till close to when she died at 80, we'd be on the phone. She'd say, so how's your weight? As though my weight was like some separate, you know, being from me, like a little pet I had. Right. Um, like, come on, pet. Come on, wait. Um... And she gave me a lot of self-consciousness, blah, blah, blah. But I think all women growing up are obsessed with their bodies, with something about how they look. And so that was the book I wanted to write, and I wasn't sure how I wanted to approach it. And it took me four, writing four books to realize, ah, this is how I want to do it, and this is what I'm going to do. Well, I'll tell you what, Randy, it's not just women uh, that go through that. Uh, and while men are more hesitant to talk about their insecurities and uh, things like that, uh, this is something that, that I think uh, will resonate deeply with, with a very broad audience. This is, this is not just a, a women's issue. Well, I appreciate hearing that, Hank, and especially I was at a writers' conference, not, excuse me, a book festival recently, and when a man I was speaking with, he was actually the husband of, of one of the writers I was talking to, I will not say who, um, told me how his mother once came into his room when he was about eleven, and he looked at him and said, "You're so fat, no woman will ever love you." Oh, what a horrible thing to what say! What a horrible to thing. <laughs> I mean, and this is, a, by the way, a perfectly lovely man. Not that it matters, but, you know, there's nothing about him that would induce any feeling of unlovability. Right. Um, and it's like, wow, we just walk around with these, oh. Oh, and, I, and I've read some incredible books by men about this. Cause I, I, Frank Bruni, I don't know if, if, if you read his memoir, Born Round. I, I have not, I don't think. He's a, um, a columnist for the New York Times. He used to be the food editor. Now he uh, writes more politics. And his is one of many that I've read, but his is the one that really stands out for me. I'm going to have to add that to my reading list. It's a wonderful, that. wonderful book. So, so you've had this opening sentence for this book for years and years, and it took you four other books to get to the place where you could write this one. Um, 
Tell me about Alice and Daphne. Um, who were they and how did they come to you? Well, first of all, I, I thought it would be real. I, I like the idea of two women who are very different having the same secret, that they're overwhelmingly preoccupied with the weight and it overshadows everything, even though there are different reasons why they're preoccupied by their weight. Um, and for one, it's her mother and, her, and, and herself and her husband is wonderful. And for the other, who met her husband when she was breakup skinny. And we all know, I think, what breakup skinny is. And then, you know, it gained uh, a bunch of weight. It's her husband. And it's just the world around you. And they're very different. I wanted to, it was important to me to get inside the skin of not just one type of person. Because this is not something that's limited to, this, this ne- neurotic behavior isn't limited to one type of person. So Daphne is Jewish and from an upper class family who owns a chain of, uh, um, not a chain, but a bunch of local jewelry stores. And she's a makeup artist for Hollywood. Uh, and for her, she had, it's something she has wrestled with her entire life because of her, her mother constantly being on her. The other woman, Alice, is half black, half white. Her father is, father is Southern Baptist. Her mother is Jewish. Her mother is teeny. Her father is very, you know, big, broad man. And she's always being told by her mother, it doesn't matter. You can be a big, beautiful black woman, which makes her crazy. And they're ve- and she is she and Alice has more of uh, my background. She lives in a neighborhood I used to live in. She has, she actually gave her a job that I used to have, which is running a local community center. Um, and they come together um, at this program that they sign up for called Wasted, which they know is going to be part of a documentary, but it's supposed to be it's an endeavor that promises healing. And they meet there with five other weight-obsessed women, and it's a nightmare. Well, several things uh, jumped out at me in the reading of this book. We're we're looking at the way families interact with each other, um, the way we deal with our outward appearance culturally and in our um, individual cultures, and and how we. Uh, how we express those things, uh, yet still deal with the same um, insecurities and the, the the same judgments that we put on people. Um, and uh, the the other side that that is really fascinating about this uh, book is the the documentary coming out of Wasted, and Wasted is spelled W A I S T E D, uh, and which really allows us to look at this idea of. Uh, kind of reality television and this mm-hmm. obsession that we have of of these mega transformations uh that are almost miraculous and really too good to believe um wh- what was the idea to bring that aspect into the book the the reality television documentary um kind of aspect well i want at first it was going. At, the first idea was that it was going to be about a reality TV show, and then, and I did some research into that. It was about, about where they would all meet there. And when I did the background research into The Biggest Loser, for instance, um, there's not a lot about it, but what there is is pretty hairy. Um, yeah. And the few people. Some really that horrible been, things happen to people. Really horrible things, and. I got enough to, it It engendered in me an idea of let's take this a step further. Let's make it where people are putting on even more of a veneer of intellectual helping and documentary filmmakers. And I, was also, I also am very fascinated by documentaries. Oh, I am too. Um, and it, it happened that a my best friend's son had won Sundance recently for a documentary. So it gave me a source to talk to about documentary. You know, um, it got, got me even more interested in, in the whole thing of people. And documentaries are always given a pass. But I thought, well, what if they're not such good people? And so it really kind of, this story idea built on itself. Once I got the basic idea of going behind the scenes and then 
I think women are, and men, but I know it more as a woman, are played with all the time. Like, how far will we go to lose weight? And I thought, well, what if that's the idea? That's the conceit of the documentary that they don't realize is, is actually going on. It's uh, it's really this weird, um, this this weird thing. Uh, I'm I'm kind of fascinated with documentaries as well. Uh, but you start to realize, um, when you get really deep into a documentary, and it it really pulls on your heartstrings or or swings you to one side um, that that a couple of hours earlier maybe you were not on the side of, and you start to to realize that there's a certain amount of emotional manipulation that goes into docu- documentary making. Uh, and that can be used for good or for evil if you, <laughs> you know, just like everything else in the world. And that's um, what happens in reality shows. Exactly. The, it's all cut. Exactly. And it's, it's made to tell a particular story. Um, when you start merging that idea with the idea of, of this struggle that so many people deal with, uh, it's kind of the perfect storm for uh, for uh, bringing out human emotion and and uh, and relationships, isn't it? Yes, and that's really I, you, you need um, pressure to make drama happen. And so I tried to really find a very pressureful place, and, and that was just right for me for it. And and also uh, one of their Alice's husband is a documentary filmmaker. And he's, you know, and he's kind of purist about it. And he, and he's, anyway, that just really fed the flames to me even a little bit more. Right. Um, what, uh, what might readers be surprised uh, about the, the direction the story takes uh, when, when this perfect storm happens? Mm, well, I don't want to give anything away. And that, that's but, why I pitched it to you like that. I'll, I'll let you say what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what they might be surprised at is how, at the, how you have these women from seven different cultures and the things that they actually end up bonding over. That, that's the part that I think that, they, that might be a surprise. Well, and, and you know, like, like all – genre fiction uh, in a way is that the 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 uh, the elements of the genre are are really window dressing that we use to tell a story about how we interact with with one another and and human emotions and and that's that's the thing that I really took away from this is that the the book is is about those things but in the grander scale it's really about how we perceive each other and how we uh, communicate with each other. Very much. And how we're all the stars of our own show, but yet where we miss them is that we think everybody's also looking at us and they're not, they're all looking at themselves. Right. Right. What a fantastic book. The, the novel is called wasted. Uh, Randy, it's, uh, it's a, an absolutely wonderful book. I'm recommending it to everyone. Um, if people are just learning about you and your work, is there a place where they can connect with you online and dig into your back catalog and follow along with what's coming up next from you? Absolutely. I keep my website very up to date. Um, it's randysusanmyers.com, so exactly like my name. And if people email me through there, they'll always get an answer. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of Wasted. Uh, Randy, it's been so much fun talking with you. Thank you for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you, Hank. You are a fantastic interviewer. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. The ancient building wore the severe cassock colors of a Puritan minister, a uniform monochrome of slate-gray shingles and soot-gray clabberts. Its shadowed upper windows cross-hatched like the facets of a spider's eye. The second story protruded beyond the first and bore the house's only ornament, two gray teardrops of wood, weeping from each corner of the building's stiff upper lip. The place would have looked sinister and foreboding in its shadowed alley if not for the die-cut silhouette of a dancing sheep 
jaunty above the door, and the two front bay windows that blazed with colorful, welcoming light. The windows were hung with orbs of colored glass on staggered lengths of ribbon. Each orb glowed with autumnal reds and delicate greens, burgundy tints and pumpkin hues, dappled raspberry and clover lime, streaked with light and weightless as bubbles over a cauldron. The shelves below offered crystal skulls and silver daggers and horny devils, Celtic chalices and woven dream catchers in dreamcoat hues. A primitive broom leaned in a corner, ready for flight, and a rhapsodic nude in bronze clutched her goat-legged lover beneath a jackal bust of Anubis. The interior of the shop was even witchier. Above a crude and sooty fireplace, a stack of brick barely holding the shape of a chimney pushed through the barn-high roof, threading ancient beams that crisscrossed overhead. Brooms and kettles and Christmas lights dangled from these, alongside Halloween costumes and Chinese umbrellas, pointy hats and bundles of herbs. Jason wandered deeper into the shop. His fingers trailed across strange bronze statuary and Aztec masks of turquoise and lapis lazuli. He rolled his eyes at the luck candles and money charms, but goggled indecently at a nude and anatomically correct silver nymph with long golden hair that reminded him of Kate. See anything you like? Jason jumped, turned, and jumped again. The woman standing before him was the living embodiment of every hippy-dippy counterculture type he'd ever seen. Her hair was green, her face pale and round, her doughy body wrapped in some elaborately woven ethnic garb. Her eyebrows were black and pierced in little rows, and her eyes were heavily circled with midnight blue, as if she'd been sucker-punched by an oil slick. She tapped the glass over the nymph. Admiring the goddess, I see. Oh, uh, uh, she practically caught him with porn. You want to hold her? She won't break. Here. The woman flipped open a glass door and handed Jason the naked figure. See how heavy she is? You could bang her against the wall all day and barely make a dent. She waggled her eyebrows, obviously enjoying his discomfort. He checked the price tag. Seven hundred bucks? The goddess is a symbol of love and fertility. Don't be ashamed of desiring her. The woman's long green fingernails plucked a long black cigarette from a long red case, and she lit it. I sense, she blew smoke and studied its whirls. Dissatisfaction in love? Yes, I have just the thing. She pulled Jason into a side room where the smell of her clove smoke gave way to the skunky aromas of potpourri sachets, tea leaves, and hanging clutches of twiggy flowers. She searched, found a little bundle, and pressed it into his hand. This will make you irresistible. Rub it on your nethers twice a day, and love shall surely find you. Jason made a face. The bundle smelled like cow manure. He didn't even want that on his hands.